Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to The Train Station. I am Bill Waldrop, along with my co-host, Jim Leaders, and we have a special guest today that is joining us. He's been a friend for years, and it's a pleasure having with us, Mr. Steve Lee. Welcome, Steve. How are you, sir? I'm just fine, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate that, sir. Yeah, we, we go back, I guess the first time we had contact was... Oh, gosh, I guess 1991 is when we were in contact with you to run those uh, trips around Texas in 1992, a year later. Yes. Yep. And, that, of course, there's stories behind that with bad fuel and <laughs> lots of people. Lots of people. Oh, yeah. There's, we, we, there are many stories involved here. But what we wanted to just do, Steve, is, is find out more about you, uh, you know, where you were raised and uh, where you worked, how you got into railroading, if you've done anything other than railroading, and how you ended up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Okay. I, I took the long way around. I was, I was born in uh, Vine Grove, Kentucky, which is about 50 miles from nowhere, but our house was right next to the Illinois Central Main Line. Yeah. And it's a small town, so the, uh, the railroad was the biggest thing around there. And, of course, you know, being a young smart ass kid it kind of uh drew my attention <laughs> and i decided i wanted to be a railroad man and starting in january 5th of 1972 i became one they hired me as a fireman on the illinois central <laughs> work, working out of louisville towards central city of kentucky and uh i made engineer in uh september of 72 and then by uh by early 77, it became uh, obvious that uh, the parent company that then owned the Union Pacific was no longer interested in the Kentucky division. And uh, I started looking for some place to go. And I got recruited by the Rock Island Railroad, you know, which is like going from the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, they put me to work in uh, Kansas City, uh, which the yard there was called Armordale, of course. And I went to work there as a uh, road foreman assistant train master. And I was there for almost two years. And then I got transferred to Silvis, Illinois, or as we used to call it, Syphilis, Illinois. Uh, it was another major hump yard. Of course, it's the first one west of Chicago. Yeah. And I had territory east of there, uh, all the way to Blue Island and west of there, all the way to Des Moines. So, um, I, I started that job and it wasn't, but, uh, it wasn't, I don't know, maybe a year later, uh, the Rock Island strike started and, um, I became suddenly everybody that could became an engineer, of course. Right. And we started trying to clean the railroad up, get all the cars off of it that we possibly could, uh, get them to destination or get them to interchange. And that went on until, uh, suddenly somebody decided that it was an emergency and they, uh, uh, president Carter at the time, uh, uh, had the ICC put the railroad under directed service orders and put us uh, under the aegis of the Kansas City Terminal Railway, which, uh, of course, is just a little switching railroad around Kansas City. Uh, the problem with that being the Kansas City Terminal was owned by 13 of our competitors. Oh, boy. Uh, so they weren't, uh, they weren't interested in making sure the railroad survived. They were make, interested in making sure it didn't. Yeah. And again, I... You know, started looking for some place to go. And Santa Fe wanted to hire me in uh, New Mexico as an engineer, but they did not want me as a road foreman or anything like that. So, then I interviewed with the SP, and then I interviewed with the UP. I uh, flew out to Denver, uh, had an interview, and come back the next day with an offer to go to Council Bluffs. Uh, Beautiful a, Council Bluffs. Yeah, good old Council Bluffs. And then before I could even make the move or even go out there the first time. They changed it to Cheyenne and what had been going on in Cheyenne, they wanted to hire me as the road foreman train master. Uh, what had been going on around here was at that point in time, which was like I say, is uh, late 79, early 80, there was a, a huge amount of railroad traffic out here and they had run into a problem with manpower. And they began hiring people as quickly as they could training them as, 
as little as they could and putting them out here as engineers. Oh my gosh. And uh, of course, that's not a recipe for trouble at all. This territory includes Sherman Hill. Oh, among other things. And in the, in the, in the space of about a year and a half, they had two fatal rear enders and a couple of runaways out here. And, uh, no, actually they had three fatal rear enders. Um, it was, uh, it was not a, a good time to uh, start over, if you know what I mean. Sure. Uh, yeah. We had, uh, just like most railroads, they had uh, uh, alcohol problems with the older guys and drug problems with the younger guys. And uh, plus the fact that they really didn't have enough experience to be doing what they should be doing. And it, it took a while to clean all of that out. But uh uh, we started on it, and uh, I, I can say the whole time I was here as a road foreman, we never had another rear ender, and we never had another collision. So, you know, I, I can't take credit for it, but I'm glad of it. Yeah. In uh, 82, or yeah, 82, I was given the additional assignment of uh, being the uh, operating officer in charge of the steam locomotives when they were on the road. The, so, that, uh, so Steve, they were still running the locomotives in some capacity at that point? They were still running the 844. Well, at that time, it was 8444. And uh, there was a group uh, working here to restore the 3985. And this was all being done under the auspices of the mechanical department, which really didn't want either one of the locomotives, but they uh, didn't have much choice. Uh, the president of the railroad made them see the light. He shined it right in their face. You know. Was that John Kennefeck? Uh Yes. Yes, it yeah. was. Uh -huh. He liked yeah. that engine, didn't he? Yeah, he did. We had several leadership I mean, changes at the executive level, at the very top executive level. And each change uh, brought about uh, another effort to end the steam program, get rid of the passenger cars, all that sort of thing. Uh, they were partly successful, but... Uh, in 86 or 87, we had one more change where the operating department decided the mechanical department had no business playing with these things. And they moved them over into the operating department and they put me in charge of them. In addition to still being a road foreman train master in Cheyenne. Oh, my goodness. So I went to work with uh, no budget and no people and uh, locomotives that had been uh, well, the 800 had had a paint job every year, but that was about it. Yeah, it was still it was still basically operational, but the 3900 was already stuffed and mounted to the Cheyenne Depot, right? That, that's exactly right. And we were only running two or three trips a year. And, uh, of course, I was having to do all the trip planning and everything else. So that, that took away a lot of time from my uh, road foreman activities. Yeah. They, uh, they transferred me from the service unit that I was working for here in Cheyenne into operating practices uh, that worked out of Omaha. And that was to get me out from under the superintendent here and uh, various other people that uh, didn't agree with what we were trying to do and were trying to, you know, mess it up every chance they got. Uh, we went to, we went from there to running more trips we uh, got more, we got people, we got a budget, we started maintaining things and we started improving things. And uh, by the early 90s, which was about the time I think I met you guys, uh, we had we had the money to uh, rebuild the shop building, which was just a, basically an empty barn type structure. Uh, a lot of fun to be in in the winter. <laughs> Uh, if you can imagine, the, the doors faced east and west, and the wind comes out of the west up here. And it's uh, it was not nice in there in the, in the uh, wintertime. Right. But we put heat in the place. We put, a, we put insulation in the place. We put I mean, all kinds of stuff, repainted everything. Uh, we started getting uh, more shop machinery so we could do more things at, at the shop in Cheyenne rather than taking the locomotive to Omaha to have something done to it. Right. And uh, they took all the mechanical department people away from us and took all the support people away from us that we had. So we had to start building a, a mechanical crew, too. And they did, uh, they did do that. They let, us, they let us have a few people. You know, the operating department on the railroad, if you tell them you need 10, they'll give you three. Right. 
uh, and they'll try to cut off the third one first chance they get. Uh, we fought through all of that and came up with a fairly successful program. We ran from, uh, from the late eighties to, uh, 2011, never missed a trip, never had a, never had a big problem. We had one problem with the 844 out in California when it uh, blew a set of flus, but we fixed that. I remember that. I was there yeah. for that. And that was not something that uh, was unusual. That happened once in a while when these things were in service. Right. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that nobody knew anything about. Right. Put it this way. We, uh, we made some other changes. We changed the fuel we were using. We changed uh, a number of things. We changed the way we did things. We changed the way the locomotives worked. Uh, how we operated them, what we could do with them. We started pulling freight with them and things of that nature. Um, All these UP presidents from Ike Evans and Mike Walsh and uh, Drew Lewis, all, all those men really enjoyed this program, didn't they? Drew Lewis did, and he made sure that Mike Walsh understood that he did. And even though Mike didn't, uh, he, uh, <laughs> he saw the light, too, for the same reason. I'll be darned. Yeah. Hey, Steve, we're, we're going to pause here for just a second. We're going to just take a quick break, and uh, uh, we'll be right back. This is the train station on TNC Radio Live. I'm Bill Walter, along with Jim Leaders, and our guest today is Steve Lee, uh, retired from the Union Pacific Railroad, but he's still involved in railroading, and more on that in just a few minutes. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Ready for the power of positive and something that will put you back to a time you wanted to last forever? Music is the ultimate time machine. What was your favorite time? Do you want to go back there? LTD Radio features the songs of the 70s, 80s, and 90s that will transport you to a happier time. It'll make you smile and brighten your day. We could all use that about now. TNC Radio.Live is proud to carry the great music of LTD Radio. Welcome back to the train station on TNC Radio Live. I am Bill Walter, along with Jim Leaders, my co-host, and our guest today is a, a longtime friend of ours. We, gosh, we've known each other a long yeah. time. Uh, Steve Lee, who is retired from the Union Pacific Railroad, uh, been telling us about his history. Steve, I do have a question. Something I'd heard, and I don't know if it's true or not. Through all your uh, uh, working history over there in the Midwest, were you ever a special agent? No, I was not. You were not, for some reason, I thought you were, and that's maybe how you met Lynn. I, I wasn't quite sure, you know, if you were or not. So you're thinking of Lynn Nystrom, uh, or the late Lynn Nystrom, which I right. said who was a special agent when he was on the rock Island. Oh, uh, you know, did you know, did you meet him we, then? Did you know him? We ended up with, uh, with three of us that, uh, had originally started on the rock Island. That was Bob Krieger, Lynn Nystrom and, and Lynn Nystrom's wife, who had also started on the rock Island. Right and myself so uh it shouldn't be too big a surprise to note that when we obtained our own caboose it happened to be an ex rock island caboose shocking i know <laughs> so so you knew them back back in your rock island days no they left before i did but you, you all just happened to end up in cheyenne yeah yeah there were uh, there at that time there were a number of ex rock island people out here working on the up yeah. Uh, some of them had left and uh, left the Rock Island in the mid uh, mid seventies, and uh, had got out here before everything really went to hell on the Rock Island. But there were at least a dozen of them out here. Wow. I had uh, I had four or five of them in engine service when I was a road foreman, and we had a we had a couple of switchmen, we had some brakemen, uh, we had some conductors. There there were quite a few out here. Uh, so to an extent, it was like an old home week. Yeah. yeah. Lots of great stories of Rock Island days, I guess. Lots of great stories. And, uh, you know, they, they had good stories up until the time they left the railroad. And then I had, uh, good stories from there until I left the railroad. Right. Right. Yeah. So we, uh, and we all knew what things could turn into. Right. You know, cause after all, the Rock Island line was a mighty fine line and that kind of <laughs> stuff wasn't supposed to happen to it, but it did. It sure did. So you said when you got to Cheyenne that the progress of uh, getting 3,900 back in service was kind of already in, in progress. So you, you weren't the leader of that. Somebody was already working on that and you yeah, got tied that, into it. That, that was, that had started the year before I got here. 
Okay. And uh, what they had was, and again, this this was all under the control of the mechanical department, which did not want to see that locomotive restored. Right. <laughs> and the locomotive was in uh, a section of the roundhouse that uh, was left over from when they tore most of the roundhouse down. Uh, they had uh, no heat, no lights, no water, no air, no anything. It was all volunteer. It was uh, employees, uh, current employees and retired employees, a lot of them from the steam era. I was going to ask you, I mean, did you have some old heads there that, that actually had operated and worked on those things with and had the knowledge to get that thing back in service? That's correct. We had several machinists. We had a couple of boilermakers. Uh, and like I say, they're, they're retired guys and, and, uh, uh, nothing energizes a retired guy better than the chance to go back to work and not have to answer to anybody. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and to get out of the house. That's right. Get out of the house, get away from the old lady, that type of thing. <laughs> uh, well, it beats sitting around the coffee shop, right. you know, three or four hours telling war stories. Right. Right. Which is something, uh, you know, later on, I had to think about myself when it became time to retire. I didn't want to be the guy that retired and then went home and didn't know what to do with himself. And, and six months later, he's dead. Right. Uh, it's a huge change in lifestyle. So uh, at any rate, it was not surprising. And some of these guys worked, worked very hard. They worked under terrible circumstances. You could only work during the daytime because uh, <laughs> the rest of the time you didn't have any lights over there. Oh, my goodness. And all that kind of stuff. We, they found parts missing on it, and they managed to find replacement parts here and there. Even the Stoker's crew, which uh, somebody had uh, sold to the city for use as a post hole digger. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And wow. They found it and, and put it back in there. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, there were a lot of strange stories with that one, too. Let's put it that way. So the engine uh, originally was built to run on coal. Um, and then they converted it to oil. What, yes. Were you were you with the program at the time that it converted to oil? Yeah, that was my idea because what happened was when we restored it and put it back in service in 1981, we made a break-in trip with it, the first trip it had made since it had been in service, down to LaSalle, Colorado, and turned around and came back. And it was burning coal and... This was in the early spring when things were still dry, and we set all sorts of grass fires everywhere we went. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and they took it to California that way, and then we also made a trip with it up into uh, Idaho and down to Utah, and basically we left a, we left a trail of burnt vegetation everywhere we went. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And everybody said, well, why is that happening? You're using lousy coal. And we said, well, we, these things were built to burn lousy coal because the railroad mined its own coal and stuff like that. But back in steam engine days, when they were running 40 or 50 of these things every day up and down Sherman Hill and every place else on the railroad, they kept everything burnt. Yeah. Uh, so nothing grew. There were very few fires. It can only burn once. That's right. So, uh, Anyway, once we got back from that uh, Idaho trip, the word came down from Omaha that you will not take that thing anywhere except between Cheyenne and Laramie. Uh, at that time, we had a place to turn it over in Laramie. So right. we couldn't go to Denver. We couldn't go west of Laramie. We couldn't go east of Cheyenne. And we put up with that until, uh, I want to say 89, 88 or 89. And... Every year we put in a request to convert it to oil and every year we were told no. And I don't, I remember what year it was, but I said, I think I've figured out where we're making our mistake. Uh, let's convert it and tell them about it later. Yeah. <laughs> about better how much, ask, about how ask. much was that project? It was quite a bit of work, but we were lucky in that we had, we already had a fuel tank. We had gotten it from uh, the uh, locomotive in North Platte yeah. and we had most of the piping and best of all, we had all of the drawings and diagrams that told us how to do it cool. uh, from, from back after World War II when they converted a lot of locomotives to oil because of a coal strike. Right. Uh -huh. right. So it was just basically uh follow the blueprints. Right. And that's what we did. 
and put it together. And then we made a, uh, we made a break-in trip with it down to LaSalle and back and didn't burn up anything. And, uh, of course the phone calls to, to, uh, Omaha went, uh, Hey, we did this, didn't burn anything. Now we can go anywhere. Oh yeah. Bring it to Omaha. So we did. Now we didn't burn anything up and all of a sudden we can run system wide. How wow. long was, how long was the engine stuffed and mounted before it was brought back in service? Well, uh, stuffed and mounted is, is a odd way to put it because, uh, it and, a, and the 4023, which is a 4884 and several other engines sat around here for years while the railroad tried to decide what to do with them. Ah. And they kept them in the roundhouse over here in Cheyenne. They pull them out every now and then for some sort of, uh, uh, display or open house or whatever, but then they'd stuff them back in the roundhouse or if the roundhouse was full, they'd just park them outside board up the windows and there they were uh this went on until the uh the late 70s and they decided to move the 4023 to omaha and display it in front of the omaha shops so it went down there on that duty and then it was well what are we going to do with this 3900 and that's when they decided to use your term stuff and mount it and they took it over to the parking lot west of, the, west of the depot, built some track in there, and shoved it in there. And there it sat for a couple of years. Oh, so it wasn't into like 20 or 30 years. It was just a, a couple of years. Yeah, it wasn't very long. Okay. Um, and uh, what got it out of there was the people, uh, our employees, basically started complaining that it took up too much parking space. Yeah, it'll do that. Yeah, so they decided to get it out of there, and about that time, uh, some of the people here that uh, had an interest in that thing started looking it over and said, hey, this thing is not in bad shape. You know, we could probably make it run, and getting it out of the parking lot was, of course, the, the, first, uh, the first battle there, and we got it out, got it over to the roundhouse, and uh, things kind of proceeded from there. They finally got the okay from... Uh, the uh, vice president of operations at the time, which was Bob Richmond. And he took it to, uh, he took a proposal to Mr. Kennefick. And the only question he had was, uh, you have any problem with this, Bob? And he said, no, he said, do it. I'll be darned. <laughs> that wow. Fast, huh? So it is said, yeah. let it be written. That was a real short decision chain. <laughs> wow. I like that. And what year was that? This would have been probably... Seven late 78, early 79. Just before Mr. Kennefick retired, I guess. Uh, Kennefick didn't retire until after the merger. Oh. Uh, which is a good thing because yeah. if he if he had been gone, so would the steam engines. Uh, that was the uh, uh, during the hostile takeover by the Missouri Pacific, that was the first uh, thing they wanted to do was get rid of the steam engines, get rid of the passenger cars, get rid of everybody involved with them. Uh, right. that, if you know what I mean. Right. And I Kinefic, Kinefic decided that the best way to introduce uh, these things to uh, who was the new chairman or becoming the new chairman at the time, which is Drew Lewis, was to uh, take them on a tour of the system and just have us casually run by them while they were down at North Platte. <laughs> 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 and they, they happened to be up on the power bridge at North Platte when we came sailing through there with the with 3,900. And that, uh, that convinced them that this was a pretty neat thing. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, so at the, at the time, uh, panic set in in Omaha. How are we going to get rid of this stuff? Uh, stuff meaning the passenger cars, everything that the railroad had at the moment. All right. Uh, they did get rid of about a dozen cars. No, about two dozen cars. They they quickly sold them to Mexico and shipped them down there across the border before they even got paid for them. They were that anxious to get rid of them. Wow. 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 Um, <laughs> and then the word came down from on high that, hey, Mr. Lewis likes these things, and he not only wants those cars back, he wants a whole bunch more cars, and you better never touch the steam engine. Oh, boy. <laughs> really? Yeah. Man. And uh, that took a while for the word to filter down through the ranks, but it did. Uh, in some cases, it did. Uh, it took effect real simple. That's what the man wants. That's what he'll get. And a few other cases, it, it took some hard heads and it took a couple of firings and transfers to get people to understand that this is what we were going to do. 
Really? Let's pa- Steve, let's pause yeah. right there. It's time for another quick break here. Uh, so we'll be right back. You are in the train station. We appreciate you joining us today. This is TNC Radio Live. Our guest today is Steve Lee, who is in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, we'll be back in just a couple minutes. Keep it right here. Stay tuned. You're listening to TNC Radio Live. Remember to tune in to the Truckers Network Radio Show with Shelly Johnson weekdays at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Welcome back to the train station. I'm Bill Walter, along with Jim Leaders, and our guest today is Steve Lee in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and you're on TNC Radio dot live uh steve one thing i remember you said a long time ago and with the stories you're telling about running these trips all over the country and everything one thing you always espoused to the crew was run every trip like it's the last one and it looks and it sounds like according to your you know your stories of that that could have happened at any time they could have shut that thing down for any reason at any time yeah or for no reason at right any time. right uh, and we i was under the uh impression or not the impression but i was convinced that if we did anything stupid or anything out of the ordinary um that brought uh disfavor to the railroad or even disfavor to certain personalities on the railroad that it's an easy decision to pick up the phone and say park them yep and uh i didn't want to be i didn't want to be the guy in charge of uh of getting them uh getting the, the program either reduced or eliminated entirely. Right. And, uh, we were, we were still trucking along pretty well, uh, right up until, uh, another management change. And, uh, we got put under somebody who decided that, uh, anybody in his department that was doing good was a threat to him. Oh my goodness. And he had to, uh, Instead of taking it like it was meant to be, which is, hey, your guys are doing a really good job and you'll know, pat yourself on the back and all of that, he decided, well, those guys want my job. Wow. Uh, which we didn't, but he was determined to clean out the whole thing. So he, uh, he, he tried to fire the person in charge of special events, but uh, uh, she fooled him. She died of cancer before he could fire her. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's had, sad. Uh, we had the, uh, he fired the uh, head of the commissary department. He fired the head of the car shops. Yeah. Uh, he fired the head of uh, several other people that had all been, been doing good jobs as what they were supposed to do. Well, and, back in the uh, early 90s, when we met uh, Bill and myself and our Gulf Coast chapter NRHS here in Houston, mm-hmm. we had written you a letter. Uh, our president, George Porter, wrote you a letter and saying, we'd like for you to come on down here. And, you know, a very big surprise. You answered it and said, we're coming <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> all the way to Texas. And, and you know, that's when we jumped into action and uh, started our first trip, which, uh, Bill, you, you think that was in 92 or Steve, you remember that was in. Uh, yeah, first trip for 92, first Fort Worth to Houston, Houston to San Antonio and San Antonio back to Fort Worth. We ran those three legs. 92 was, was one of the biggest years we had. And that was, that was the year we went to the, uh, we started out by going to the, uh, NRHS convention in San, uh, St. Louis. No, it was in, it was on the West coast. Uh, oh. uh, San St. Louis was, St. Louis was 1990. Yeah. This, this was, uh, this was in San Jose. Oh, uh, uh-huh. And we went all the way to the West coast on that. We were, in fact, we were, uh, we were parked on the bay there, uh, under in, uh, Oakland on that one. And we came back to Cheyenne from that trip and we, uh, went to Houston and did the uh, trips for you guys and, uh, came back up. And then we, uh, made the uh, trip over to Tennessee with the, uh, Eastern Tennessee and Western uh, Virginia with the 3985 for the CSX Santa train. And of Golly. course, uh, if we recall that story, they didn't believe you were really coming right until you showed no, up. They there. didn't, they didn't, they were, they <laughs> tell were, us a, tell us a little bit quickly about the CSX. The CSX was the, <laughs> one of the employees told us that CSX stood for confusion, stupidity, and gridlock. <laughs> and he was right. 
Yeah. This was a railroad that was the result of very many mergers in years before, but they had never consolidated anything. They were still operating under different signal systems. They were still operating under, you know, whatever the host road had been. That's what, that's the way they were. Yeah. It was not coordinated, nothing. (laughs) <laughs> and when somebody said, uh, well, they're going to bring a steam engine over here, everybody says, ha, 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 I'll believe that when I see it. And I made it made several trips back there to go over the entire territory, talk to all the local officials, all this sort of thing, so they would know what was coming. And I got pretty much the same thing. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. And they pretty much filed it away and didn't think about it. Until the day we showed up at Memphis on their railroad. Oh, <laughs> and total panic. Yeah, uh, nobody had expected that that this would come true, and there had been a block in communication somewhere between their executive offices and the field, and the word never really got to them, and uh, nobody took it seriously. Uh, so we show up, and they're now. What do we do? And I said. Don't do anything. We've got this all planned out. We've got it all figured out. Oh, well, we'll do this for you. We'll do the fuel. We'll do all this other stuff. And I said, no, you won't. You don't even know what you're doing now. Right. <laughs> we've, we've got it all set up. Uh, the best thing you can do is stay out of the way. Uh-oh. So we showed up in Memphis and the yard master says, what the heck is this? And I said, don't you remember me standing here and telling you about this uh, six months ago? Well, yeah, but I didn't think it would happen. That's well, there it is. It's happened. Oh no. What are we going to do? And it didn't help that Nystrom, who was the fireman that day was dressed up in an Elvis costume. Oh Oh, Lord. (laughs) 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 So at any rate, when we, we left Nashville headed, I mean, uh, Memphis headed for Nashville and the entire What the crews back there called the Death Star, which was the CSX dispatching office in Jacksonville. Right. Went completely berserk. They had no idea and didn't know what to do. First thing they did was call us on the radio and tell us uh, not more than 25 miles an hour until we figure this out. And I said, talk to this guy and this guy. We figured it out a long time ago. Right. Um. And it went on and on and on. And it was like that every day (laughs) until we got to Kingsport. And when we got there, Kingsport, Tennessee, and when we got there, there were actually a few people that had a clue what was going on. So uh, we did the Santa train and we uh, we had Jerry Davis with us, who was president of the CSX at the time. And of course he, you know, he came up to the tool car and, uh, on the trip, I'm told I was on the engine. He came up the tool car and says, Hey, uh, you know, I used to work for the UP and they said, well, when we get home, we may be able to say that ourselves. <laughs> right. Right. If I recall. <laughs> yeah. But he had a good time and, uh, the trip was very successful. And we, uh, in fact, we spent Thanksgiving that year in, uh, uh, West Virginia at the car shops. They're just across the river from Kentucky at Huntington. Yeah, Huntington, West Virginia. Uh-huh. And, uh, by then, we had long since run out of patience with some of these uh, local local yokels, as they call them, the, uh, right. the local managers who didn't have a clue but knew they were in charge. And uh, this this one guy that the shop superintendent there says, "Well, you gonna uh, you want to tell us uh, if you want to be locked in or locked out." I said, what do you mean locked in or locked out? He said, we go home Wednesday, we lock all the gates, and we don't come back until Monday. Uh, So if you want to be outside, you better have your trucks outside. And if you want to be inside, you better have them inside, but then you can't go out. And I said, oh, we got torches. We can get out. (laughs) (laughs) Torches and bolt cutters. Yeah. I said, where do you want the, where do you want the hole in the fence? (laughs) And uh, it's, well, we'll give you a key. So we got the key to the gate, all that sort of thing. And we had our Thanksgiving dinner there on the, inside their shop. And, uh, you know, you're sitting around that many days, you, you know, you run out of things to do. So you figure, Hey, uh, let's see if we can find one of these engines that will run and let's switch their yard for them. Oh, oh no. no. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing will be where they thought it was when they get back. 
and you oh. were gone, right? Yeah, we found an SD50 that had an engine in it and had batteries in it and it would start. And uh, we switched our train and then we started switching their yard. <laughs> just for the heck of it, you know. Yeah. Wow. Just to keep in practice. Right. Yeah, right. And, and all that. And then we we uh, we found a building with a door open and we or a door that we could open and we put the SD50 inside it killed it, put the door down and hid it from them. Basically, I don't know how long it took them to find it, but <laughs> at any rate, uh, we left there the Monday morning. We were supposed to, we came back to, uh, got back on the UP at, uh, at, uh, St. Louis. Um, we got on the, uh, TRRA at East St. Louis and we stopped and kissed the ground because we were all off of the CSX by then. Right. I'll bet. Yeah. And went over and displayed in Union Station and then uh, went on to Omaha, or, or not Omaha, but, uh, well, West Omaha, and uh, back to Cheyenne. And we were on the road a lot that year. I, I think I added it up. We were on the road uh, something like 90-some-odd 90, 90 days out of that year. Mm. And uh, it was a very, very busy year, but a very productive year. It was. And uh, we, we took the locomotive to places it had never been before. And, you know, Houston is one of them. I mean, it never came down there, you know, right. before. Right. And uh, we made a lot of friends. We made uh, uh, we made some impressions, good and bad, I'm sure. But uh, it was a it was a worthwhile trip. And like I say, we got to meet some people that led us uh, into further trips in the future. And that included Houston and various other places around there. Ran into a lot of people that knew how to get things done and weren't afraid to do it. That's awesome. Guys, let's take another break here real quick. We are streaming through this hour very quickly. Our guest today is Steve Lee of Cheyenne, Wyoming, and retired from the Union Pacific Railroad. I'm Bill Walter, along with Jim Leaders, my co-host. This is TNC Radio.Live. We'll be right back. Be sure to catch the Truckers Network Radio Show with your host, Shelly Johnson, weekdays at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, right here on TNC Radio.Live. Welcome back to the train station. This is TNC Radio Live. I'm Bill Walter, along with Jim Leaders, my co-host, and our guest today is Steve Lee from Cheyenne, Wyoming, and retired from the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, Steve, real quick, we talked in the last se last segment about uh, CSX and all that, and all the travels we you did in 1992 with the steam engine. But what people don't know is, before all of these trips, you had to physically drive all of that to check track curvatures where the fire hydrants are and things like that. So yeah, you traveled a lot by steam engine, but you also drove all of that yourself. Yeah, you had to, there, there are things you have to do in advance. If you want things to go right, when you, uh, when you, uh, make the actual trip, like you, you know, and you brought up a good one, where are the fire hydrants that we can reach and, uh, with a fire hose, what kind of couplings do they use? Do we have the adapters for them? That type of thing. Uh, where's the hotels? Uh, what is the address you want to send the fuel truck to? Uh, you know, you, you can't just tell him, uh, well, take it to Cincinnati and we'll meet you there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, you, yeah. You got to be a little bit more, uh, um, right down to, right down to can a semi get down this street to where we're going to be parked. You right. Know? Right. Uh, little things like that, where the hotels are, where you can get breakfast at three o'clock in the morning for your, uh, morning crew, uh, you know, stuff like that, that, that nobody thinks of unless you don't do it. And then the whole world knows, you know, right. Uh, right. Uh, so, you know, I'm down in foreign territory, uh, well, foreign territory to everybody, but me, uh, you know, I'm looking for the, where's the next waffle house, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, how do you get into this place? You know, how do you, how, where are we going to park it? How far is it to the hotel? Which direction is the hotel? Uh, all the kind, all those little uh, detail things that uh, if you do them right, everything happens just you know clickety click, just the way it's supposed to. If you miss one of them or you don't do it right, uh, you end up with no water or you end up with no fuel or the fuel truck is uh, uh, went to some city a hundred miles away or didn't show up at all or or whatever, or the hotel doesn't have your reservations or you know, all this kind of stuff. Wow. That's a lot of responsibility, but, but it worked. And I remember y'all you, you came to Houston a whole lot 
uh, after that also with steam yeah, and diesel and all. Yeah. And so finally I asked you guys one time, this is years ago. I said, why do y'all keep coming down to Houston so much? It's so far away. And the response was, well, three things said, the people are friendly. The girls are, fr are pretty and y'all know how to eat. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. It wasn't gonna, this California cuisine. You, this is good Texas eating, boy. You, we fed you down here. Yeah. I, yeah, you got good steaks. That was the best thing. Absolutely. Taste of Texas, baby. Yeah. And you got Whataburger. <laughs> yes, sir, we do. <laughs> and they're going nationwide. So you may end up with one in Cheyenne eventually. I they're don't know. I don't know. Somebody around here would probably shoot them if they came in that way. Probably so. Now, let <laughs> me ask you real quick. Now, going back again to the beginning, you started working for the railroad because you lived near the railroad in Kentucky. Did you ever imagine in your wildest dreams that you would be involved in getting steam locomotives online and running all over the country? And, and what are your, I mean, did you even think about something like that? If I had thought about something like that, somebody would have made me lay down and put a, a cold cloth on my forehead and hope for it to go away. Right. Uh, no, I never, never, ever. Even after I came to the UP and knew that I was in Cheyenne and rumor has it, there was a steam engine here, all that sort of thing. No, I had no idea. Did you have any interest in steam engines at all? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I have some interest in it. I, I made a trip on the 4501 one time, the Southern steam engine. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, at that time I was still, uh, an engineer on the IC. And, uh, when they invited me up in the cab, the first thing this, this, uh, grouchy old road foreman said was, uh, why don't you climb back there in the tender so you stay out of the way and you don't fall off. Oh, oh my and God. And I said, well, okay, that's fine. Well, on our break in trip with the 3985, uh, when it was still cold, uh, we had, uh, we had two cabooses on that train. One of them was full of invited guests, right? Uh, which included, uh, at that time, David P. Morgan from trains magazine. And lo and behold, he brought this old grouchy road foreman from the Southern out there with him. The same man, the same man. Oh. And he says, uh, can I get up and look there? And I said, well, yeah, but you better get back in the tender so you don't fall off you old fart. <laughs> and, uh, that wasn't Jim Biceline, was it? No, 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 no. no this was no. one of the dove brothers. Oh, the dove. I don't, I don't know them. This was, <laughs> you, all, you know, they had the, the two, these two guys were steam engine engineers from back when they, I mean, really, really Southern steam engineers. Yeah. Both had been road foremen. There was uh, Lloyd Dove and Walter Dove. Uh, yeah. Walter was the oldest one. Lloyd was the grouchy one. Yeah. And uh, he got grouched right back at him. He, he looked at me like I just landed from Mars. When I stood there. <laughs> Did he remember you? No, he didn't. And I reminded him, though. And then I said, <laughs> yeah, you can get up there if you want to. I'm not as bad as you were. <laughs> <laughs> I rode behind 4501 a couple of times with NRHS conventions out of New Orleans. You know, mm -hmm. we ran over to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and all that. Had a beautiful whistle on that engine, and it was yes, it great. Did. It was a great engine. It did. It did. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It was fun. I rode it from, uh, let's see, I rode the cab from, uh, we made a trip from Louisville over to Princeton, Indiana, and back. Yeah. And, uh, I was with the NRHS in Louisville at the time. I, I was a car host of all things. Wow. And, uh, -huh. uh, after we made our last photo run, when there wasn't any, uh, uh, reason to be in the vestibule, you know, to let people on and off. Um, uh, I went, I was invited up to the engine to, uh, you know, shake hands with royalty and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and, uh, it went, it went from there. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I never, I, uh, I thought even at the course, again, I was an engineer for the IC. I never thought I'd have a chance to get the old part back, but I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, nowadays, um, you are still involved in railroading. Now you've been retired from UP. What about uh, 10 years now, nine years, 10 years. I retired on December 31st of 2010. Okay. And I sat around the house for what, six months or so. And, uh, my wife who had been complaining the entire time we were married about how much traveling I had to do. Right. 
and all this kind of stuff started asking questions like, don't you have some place to go? <laughs> <laughs> or don't right? you have something to do? Yeah. And I said, well, not really, but I can probably find something. And then, uh, I guess the word got out and it got to, uh, got up to John Ramosh here at, uh, Wasatch. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, he invited me to lunch one day and wanted to know if I wanted to come to work for them part time. And I said, doing what? And he said, I don't know yet, but you need something to do. And, uh, <laughs> My first job for him was to uh, take a truck and trailer to Chicago and load up uh, a bunch of flues, tubes, rails, all kind of stuff for some small steam engines and uh, bring them back here. And then it got into more things, uh, restoration. We, uh, I was deeply involved in restoration of the uh, uh, Jim Crow passenger car that is now in the Smithsonian. I remember you telling me that story of how you had to get that into uh, the, the museum building. and then yeah. build the building around it. But I'll tell you what, let's wrap up this hour. Uh, Steve, if you don't mind joining us, we'd like to have you back again on next week's show uh, to continue uh, all the great stories and memories here. It's all fascinating. I have more questions. If you don't mind sticking around, we'll, uh, we'll take care of that. No problem. Sounds good. Thank you, folks, for tuning in to the train station today on TNCRadio.live. I'm Bill Waldrop, along with Jim Leaders. Our guest today is Steve Lee, and we're going to have him back on next week's show as well. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the next program.